Welcome everybody to this last late for 2010. Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for coming more than once if that applies to you. Uh, as you know, the theme this year has been innovation <clears throat> and tonight we'll be taking that theme into an ethereal realm, perhaps. <laughs> We're here to discuss faith. After all, it, it's nearly Christmas, only 22 shopping days to go, uh, which apparently it was once a religious festival until it was bought and copyrighted by the warehouse. At the same time, there's always been this palpable reaction against that commercialization. Um, bear with me a couple of personal anecdotes. A while ago when I was editing The Listener, I remember writing an editorial for our Christmas edition about this, how the culture had turned its biggest annual festival into little more than an exercise in keeping the consumer economy ticking over and that needed to examine its soul a little more. I mean, I thought it was a fairly ordinary observation <coughs> written to deadline, but the response really surprised me. A huge amount of correspondence from people agreeing with me and grateful that someone had just expressed these ideas publicly. And at least a couple of clergymen got in touch very politely to ask if they could <clears throat> read my editorial out as part of their Christmas sermons. I'd been accused of preaching to the converted in the past, but this was quite new to me. At the same time, we also broke with tradition, if you can call it that, and we didn't do a corny Santa Claus cover. Instead, we chose a beautiful Renaissance image of Jesus as our cover image. And uh, also to my surprise, it was a runaway bestseller, <clears throat> second only to Nando Tanchos. <laughs> from then on, I was always looking for excuses to put God on the cover anyway. Anyway, what I took from these small examples was that there was and is a genuine appetite out there for the spiritual, the non-material, the profound, call it what you want, which extends to the humanist, secularist, and atheist among us too. And the extent to which organized religions are meeting those needs, of course, is open to debate, which is what we're here to do. Similarly, the degree to which religions are meeting the challenges of globalization, environmental and economic crisis, and the recent outbreak of what has been called militant atheism is far from clear. So there's one person eminently qualified to discuss those issues, and it's the man sharing the stage with me this evening, finally. Good evening. <laughs> Lloyd Gearing is a name we've been associating with the highest levels of theological thought for a very long time now. A doctor of divinity and a former Presbyterian minister, he was famously accused of doctrinal error and disturbing the peace and unity of the church, in other words, heresy, back in 1967, but to our great benefit was neither burned at the stake nor otherwise silenced. Among many other things, he's a member of the Jesus Seminar a group of biblical scholars dedicated to reconstructing a clearer picture of the historical Jesus. We'll talk about that in a minute, but please welcome Lloyd Gearing. Why don't you define what you mean by the divine then? Ah, oh, the divine <clears throat> is that which transcends us. Now, what are the things to which we feel we have to respond. Now, in the traditional Christian tradition, you responded to God up there in heaven. But what is God? In the days when people felt the supernatural world was a reality, it made some sense to talk about our Father who is in heaven, because the heavens transcend us. But we now see the heavens as part of a tremendous space-time continuum, which is so old and so large that our minds can no longer understand it. And it transcends us. Now, within this reality, and of course, science has helped us to understand something of the way it works. In this reality, there are values. And the values that transcend us are truth. We are seeking it. And justice. We want to see justice portrayed in our human relationships. 
and love. Now these values transcend us, but they are, of course, what we've always regarded as the attributes of God. As the New Testament itself, it says, God is love. So these transcend us. Now the word God has become a tremendous big problem because most think of God in a, with an image which is no longer satisfactory. And that's why John Robinson said, 1963, Bishop of Robinson, our image of God must go. It's, all, it, 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 it's, it's, it's no longer satisfactory. And of course the trouble is, even the word God might have to go. You see, the word God is only used in the Abrahamic religion. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Buddhism gave the idea of God away two and a half thousand years ago. In Chinese language, there isn't a word for God. So you, when you use the word God, you immediately show you have been shaped by Western culture. Now, it's played a very big role, very important role. What the word God did was it helped us unify the world we live in. You're touching on an idea that, that I've heard expressed, which is that far from religions and evolution being antithetical ideas, religions are actually an evolutionary adaptation. They're a product of human evolution. What oh, do you think of that idea? Oh, undoubtedly. And that they've been very powerful and that they've helped us in just the ways you've tried to explain. Yes. Now, religion, like the word God, has become a very problematical word because some people are for it and some people are against it. Let me give my definition of religion. Religion is a total mode of the interpreting and living of life. Everybody who takes life seriously, in my view, is taking the first steps in religion. And this definition of religion, fortunately, covers all the types of religions we've had or will have in the future because it recognizes that religion is a human product. Religion is what we humans have evolved in our culture to enable us to make meaning of life and to live together in the most harmonious way. Does that satisfy your point? Fully. <laughs> Let me just change tack for a second. What do you make of this rise of what has been called militant atheism in the last, it's relatively recent. I don't think atheism is relatively recent, but there's been a real upsurge of popular atheism, you might call it. What do you, how do you explain it? It's hard to understand why there has been a burst of books in yeah. that direction, because atheism has been steadily growing ever since David Hume onwards. Uh, and I often take this as a testing point. At the beginning of the 19th, uh, the, the beginning of the 20th century, most people in New Zealand would be offended if you said they weren't a Christian. At the end of the 20th century, you could actually offend a Christian by a, a person by saying they were a Christian. <laughs> there has been, during the 20th century, greater change than ever before. It's partly the fact that we're growing up, we're becoming a race that has come of age. We come to realize we have to be responsible for ourselves. We, we can't expect a God out there to, to do it for us. And so, uh, why have these men written as they have, Richard uh, Dawkins. Dawkins, for example. Well, I think it's because when they go to America, they find it very different. You see, we are much more like Europe. 
We are much more secularized. In fact, New Zealand is the most secularized country in the Western world. But when you go to America, where most people claim to have some connection to the church, and where fundamentalism has been so strong, I mean, 30% of Americans are fundamentalists. And so they feel that fundamentalism is a very dangerous force. And with that, I agree with them. It is a very dangerous force. I mean, the irony is, as, as you were saying before, fundamentalists claim to be the, the upholders and the, and the owners of the truth and, and appeal to the past, but in fact, they're a modern phenomenon, really, relatively yes, modern yes, anyway. That, yes, fundamentalism is a modern phenomenon. What fundamentalism does is to try and defend a f set of beliefs which were appropriate in the pre-modern world. And in that sense, of course, it is simply superstition. I define superstition as any belief or practice which has outlived the context in which it was once appropriate. And a good deal of traditional Christianity is afraid, is I'm sorry to say, superstition. How then should modern Christianity adapt or have adapted to the big questions and challenges facing people living in this modern world? Well, it should have adapted by simply going on from where it was in 1900, but it has failed to do that. And because of that, I don't see the traditional churches uh, really able to do it anymore. I'm sorry to say that because I say it from within the church. Even though the Pope has changed his stance on condoms? Oh, that's very small indeed, really. Uh, the, no, the, 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 the Pope's ever since John the 23rd, who set a marvelous standard, they have been reactionary, really. And so, uh, I don't want to speak unkindly because the Church of Rome has, uh, it, it's still the biggest religious institution in the world, and one would like to see it uh, move in, but it's got so far to go that it's hard to see it possible. What's happening is that there are movements growing up outside the church now which are doing what the church should be doing. What, what movements are those? I mean, do you sort of include the green movement? I would in? certainly include the greens. The greens, and not all greens uh, say, speak a lot of sense, I'm a green myself, but <clears throat> the green movement worldwide is dealing with what are the real religious issues of our day. The real religious issues of our day is how are we to respond to the forces of nature in such a way that there will be a world worth living in for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And so in many ways, the Greens, without realizing it, are doing in the 20th and 21st century what the first Christians began to do in the first century. And you know what happened to them, don't you, when the Romans got hold of them? Exactly, and, and that's, in, what, that's why the Greens have had to struggle. And they're called communists by reactionary American that, political forces. That, that's true. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the reactionary Christians today are doing exactly what the reactionary Romans did in the first century. That is, preserving the ancient gods when their day had been come to an end. Mm. Let's go back to what happens when we become secular. Well, for a start, why has New Zealand become such a secular nation? Do you have an explanation for that, given that we come from a, an immigrant Christian tradition? It's, uh, I don't know if this is the whole answer, but I have observed that each of the English-speaking countries which came out of England still reflects the period in which the first immigrants came. 
That is why America is still reflects the Puritans. That's why Australia still reflects the period of the uh, 18th and early 19th century. And New Zealand reflects the 19th century. Now, what was happening? In the 19th century England, secularism was beginning to grow. Indeed, one of the great proponents of the secular world was a man called Holyoke, a distant relation of our own Prime Minister. At times, listening to you, you do even sound a little bit like Richard Dawkins, who can be quite uncompromising and, you know, have no truck with supposedly subtle arguments about the need for mystery and so on, because he says there's enough majesty and mystery in nature. Uh, well, I would totally no, agree with that. There's no need to go any further than that. But the point is, <clears throat> because the universe is big and cold and empty, as far as we can tell, that's scary. So the reaction to that, of course, is to take refuge in a knowable religion and to want there to be a divine being who will look after us and protect us. Surely we can't just be floating around on a rock in the middle of nowhere. It would be nice to have fairies looking after you, but none of us would ever think that it would be of any value to us. In this, so I don't think you can really think back to that. If, if you've already got that, I can understand why people try to preserve it. But there's no, there's no way in which the secular world can really go back to that, to the, to the past. And another thing about, about the past is that it leads us to think that when we come to difficult positions, we can all hand it over to God and let him decide. What we have to learn in the modern secular world is that we humans have to take responsibility, something we don't always feel very happy about doing, particularly when it comes to climate change. And at which point, if we do take responsibility for everything and we accept what we know and what we don't know, is there any need for religion at that point, or have we finally reached where we should be? That is our religion. God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> Perfect note on which to ask if there are any questions from the floor. First, I'd like to thank you for your uh, thoughts tonight. With your honorable tenure, um, I just want to ask you, you mentioned earlier what you thought the highest expression of a human can be. That's it? I, I'd like to know. Nice question. The highest expression of a human, what can it be? Something you mentioned earlier. The highest expression. As human beings, we have the potential to think, to feel, to love, to contribute to communities. Indeed, we are all products of a community, and, and, and without our cultural past, we could not be what we are. So we draw from that and try in our own personal and individual way to develop it into something we can hand on to the next generation. Human beings are not individuals full stop. Individuals are part of a living whole, a community, a network. We owe everything we value in ourselves to the countless generations who have preceded us. Indeed, it's because they've died that we can live. Well, it's been an... <laughs> it's been a real pleasure and an honor sharing the stage with one of the very few people I've met who could even answer that question. <laughs> uh, 
And I'd like to thank you all once again for coming, and would you please once again thank Lloyd Gearing.